And uh, like uh, Jasmine, I certainly express uh, my concern for uh, all of the people uh, who affected by COVID, uh, particularly those who uh, are, are suffering the consequences uh, directly uh, uh, from a public or from a health perspective. And, and for those uh, healthcare workers and essential workers that are keeping everything going for us all right now, which is greatly appreciated. Uh, it uh, definitely is an unusual time, and I uh, really appreciate you taking the time today uh, to uh, talk about an, another issue, um, and, and perhaps a bit of a distraction uh, from uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, omnipresence of, of the COVID crisis. Uh, so I'll just get started here, and as Jasmine mentioned, there will be time for questions at the end, hopefully at least uh, 10 or 15 minutes. So um, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, put your questions in the comment box or raise your hand at the end, whatever works best for you. So uh, last year I presented on the uh, youth vaping crisis. And uh, so there is gonna be some repetition today if some of you participated last year. But uh, this year is going to be a little more focused, this time a little more focused on the policy options that are available to address uh, the youth vaping crisis. Now just to get started, ASH is Western Canada's leading tobacco control organization. We've been around for a few decades now, and uh, over the years we've provided local, provincial, national, and even global leadership on tobacco control. One of our latest uh, success stories uh, in recent years, uh, from a, at least the global perspective, is uh, our work on uh, securing uh, a provincial and national ban on flavored tobacco products. Uh, so a, a lot of that work uh, started right here in Alberta, uh, ultimately spread to other provinces, ultimately became national policy, and, and now we have a growing number of nations uh, around the world that are following Canada's, uh, Alberta's and Canada's example by banning flavored tobacco. In fact, all the EU member countries will have uh, flavor bans in place by the end of 2020. And uh, our uh, efforts over the years have focused primarily on public awareness and education uh, that we don't have a big, a big budget for uh, big media buys and, and advertising. So most of our public awareness and education activities are done via publicity and earned media strategies. Uh, and uh, our focus is primarily on prevention and public policy measures. And for us, it's about bang for the buck. We're a small organization. Uh, I've got about six staff and um, we, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have huge bu a huge budget to provide programs and services to people who need to want to quit smoking or kids uh, or for prevention programs. What we do is we support the development of policy measures to make all of that, to enable all of that, to get the governments to put significant funds in place, to put so meaningful far, so policy measures in place uh, to protect kids and to, from smoking and tobacco and vaping and to encourage smokers to quit. And of course, we are very concerned about the explosive rise in youth vaping and its potential implications on tobacco use as well. So far, so good, Jasmine? Okay, great. So if there are any problems, just let me know. So youth and vaping, uh, it's a, nicotine is one of the most addictive substances on the planet. It only takes a few cigarettes smoked in a, consecutively to develop a, a lifelong addiction, uh, particularly among youth. And, uh, and the vast majority of people who start smoking are under the age of 18. So, uh, and that's when the addiction starts. So for that reason, nicotine addiction and tobacco dependency have been classified as pediatric illnesses because the vast majority of people who start are under the age of 18. And uh, nicotine addiction is the fundamental health hazard associated with smoking. It's the fundamental health hazard that leads to everything else, including cancer, heart disease, lung disease. And as you can see from the slide here, kids who, risk, who vape are, are definitely risking nicotine addiction. 
and are four times as likely to start smoking as kids who don't vape. So vaping itself is harmful. Smoking is even more harmful. Uh, so we need to prevent nicotine addiction among youth to prevent both outcomes. And uh, some startling numbers came out just before Christmas, a few days before Christmas, uh, under the Canadian Student Tobacco and Drug Survey, which is done every two years. It's about, the total survey involves about 50,000 students across Canada in grades uh, 6 to 12. And that survey revealed that we now have 400,000 youth vapors in Canada, about 50,000 in Alberta. And uh, that's about three or four times higher. The, high, the number is three or four times higher, depending on the province, than the number of kids who are using tobacco. So uh, it's very disturbing, and it's a trend that we have to curtail. As I mentioned, uh, vaping is not harmless, especially among youth. The fundamental health hazard of vaping is identical to the fundamental health hazard of smoking, and that is nicotine addiction. And uh, of course, youth are being targeted with uh, alluring high nicotine stealth devices, nicotine delivery devices like Juul, Vipe, and Logic. So that's a huge concern. There's a number of vaping products out on the market, and uh, in including traditional pens or the e-cigarette that we think of that these devices first came out 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, since then, we've had uh, mods which carry more nicotine and uh, people who are quitting are more likely to use the mods uh, because it's a cheaper means of uh, getting nicotine than the disposable pens or the disposable pods. But uh, kids are using pods. And uh, if we think of Juul and Vipe and Logic, these are all disposable nicotine cartridges or pods. And uh, that is, they've, they've really been aggressively targeted toward kids. And uh, they're very easy to conceal. They contain high levels of nicotine. So uh, you know, we have to make sure that we are addressing all of these products simultaneously and making sure that uh, we're taking steps to curtail nicotine limits, levels, and other uh, aspects of these products that uh, could lead to youth addiction. So the concern about youth vaping, I've already talked about nicotine addiction, uh, but the potential for tobacco dependence is probably the single most concerning uh, single, big, single biggest public health concern, the potential for kids to graduate from using uh, vaping products, becoming addicted to nicotine, and subsequently becoming dependent on tobacco. You know, imagine uh, uh, a, a teenager running out of pods and uh, desperate for nicotine. They're, you know, they're they addic addicted at, at that point, and they see a pack of cigarettes. And there are no, no pods around. They, they, the store is, uh, is uh, you know, 20 minutes away, and they need a nicotine fix right now. Uh, that pack of cigarettes is, is going to be pretty attractive. And uh, it's uh, very easy to transition from being addicted to the nicotine in a vaping product to becoming addicted to tobacco products. But tobacco products are more deadly. And uh, we, you know, vaping is not safe. Uh, and there is a re recent study showing, in fact, that it contributes to lung disease. Uh, it's a 40% increase in certain lung diseases among people who vape. So it's not as harmless as we've all been led to believe. And uh, uh, you know, we can't get away from the fact that uh, these products are very addictive and can easily lead to tobacco dependency. Another problem is the possible renormalization of smoking, because uh, the more people are using these devices in public, and the more kids see people using these devices, the more normal it becomes. So uh, yeah, that's a that's a huge concern as well, and it can be difficult to tell the difference between smoking and vaping. Uh, there are other health hazards of vaping as well. They there are safety issues and. Um, uh, you know, these, these devices are, have, have been known to 
to explode, for example. Uh, so we, we have to take those uh, risks into account. And uh, there are a number of regulatory inconsistencies by region, by province, municipality, uh, and, and between products, and certainly between vaping products and tobacco products. We have huge regulatory inconsistencies. Uh, now, uh, clouding and vape tricks are, you know, this, these are uh, alluring activities that uh, the vaping companies have promoted. They've held competitions. They promote this stuff on social media. And uh, it's, it's very attractive. You know, I could see a teenager being uh, attracted to this kind of activity. And the, the vaping companies, uh, we, you know, clouding competitions, uh, yeah, th this stuff has been widely promoted. And it's definitely attracting kids in, into vaping. Now, with kids, uh, it's really an issue of monkey see, monkey do. Uh, modeling is an essential element of childhood development. And if we model healthy behaviors to kids, we're more likely to get healthy kids. And if we model unhealthy behaviors, we're going to get more unhealthy behaviors, uh, kids engaging in unhealthy behaviors. Uh, and, you know, to a five-year-old, whether someone is smoking or vaping or toking, whether it's an e-cigarette, a, a pod, a mod, a cigar, it's, to a five-year-old, it's all the same thing. It's all smoking. Uh, I have a hard time from, from a distance distinguishing between wh whether someone's smoking or vaping. So, you know, to a five-year-old, it's, it's all the same thing. And that we know that um, the literature tells us that the more kids are exposed to smoking, whether it's in the home or in social settings or even movie theaters, the more likely they are exposed or on video film, the more likely they are exposed to smoking and the portrayal of smoking, the more likely they are to become smokers themselves. So the, this whole issue of renormalizing smoking is a huge concern for the public health community. Here are the stats uh, over the past four years from the major national survey, Canadian Student Tobacco, Alcohol and Drug Survey, among uh, about 50,000 kids across Canada in grades 7 to 12. And just an explosive rise in vaping. Uh, in fact, in Alberta, it's up almost 400% in just four years. And uh, as you can see, we now have 20%, 50,000 kids in Alberta, 400,000 kids across Canada, 20% of all students in grades 7 to 12 who have used e-cigarettes vaping devices in the past 30 days. And of course, all of those kids, that's, you know, that's 50,000 too many in Alberta. And uh, those 50,000 kids are risking nicotine addiction. And many have become addicted. And there's a lot of interplay between smoking and vaping, as you can see from this slide. And uh, in terms of order of initiation, um, some kids are, are starting with e-cigarettes, some are starting with cigarettes, some are using both. Uh, but there's a lot of interplay, and, and this is why um, we, we're seeing that there is a four per, or that kids who vape are four times as likely to start smoking because uh, of that interplay. And once they're hooked on nicotine, uh, they're far more susceptible to tobacco dependency. Uh, now, the vaping companies themselves are not exactly innocent bystanders in all of this. And they have been aggressively targeting youth with predatory marketing campaigns for the past several years. And uh, through social media, broadcast, retail, print, outdoor advertising, you've seen it all. And you don't have to look too far. And, uh, you know, obviously kids are, are seeing all of these promotions as well. They're seeing more than the rest of us because kids live on social media. And, and that's where the concentration of promotions have been. So we definitely need to put some stronger controls in place uh, at federal, provincial, and municipal levels. Uh, the uh, pods like Juul, Vipe, and Logic have very high nicotine levels. 
In fact, they use a special formulation of nicotine called nicotine salts, which just means that it's a formulation that is more readily ab absorbed into the bloodstream. And in fact, uh, one pod can e equal the same, uh, uh, the, the nicotine in one pod is equivalent, some of these pods is equivalent to one pack of cigarettes, the same level of nicotine. So uh, it's, a, it's a huge concern. And um, uh, the youth and non-smokers should not be using nicotine products because of the addictive properties, obviously. Um, smokers trying to quit, uh, it's, it's a different story. And, uh, uh, you know, there has been uh, some evidence showing that uh, uh, nicotine replacement helps smokers quit smoking. Uh, and that that uh, extends to vaping devices. However, um, we should be doing everything possible to keep these devices out of the hands of kids. Uh, as mentioned, vaping is a risk factor for tobacco uptake and dependency, particularly among youth. Uh, but you know, we've also, also heard of non-smokers just taking up vaping uh, just because it's something to do and the, you know, the popular thing. And uh, they subsequently end up smoking. And uh, here's a really shocking stat at the bottom. Um, you know, if we're talking about, okay, what, what is, what are the, what's the public health impact for smokers? You know, and providing this product as a form of nicotine replacement to get smokers to quit. Is there some public health utility in that? Well, yes, yes, there is, absolutely. However, when you trade that off against the number of kids, you know, 400,000 in Canada, against the number of kids who are taking up smoking because they became addicted to nicotine resulting from vaping, it's an 80 to one relationship. So uh, we've got 80 kids starting smoking because they got addicted to nicotine from vaping for every smoker who successfully quits from vaping. So um, that's not a good trade-off. And uh, that means we should be playing, uh, putting extra uh, effort and attention on doing everything absolutely possible to keep kids out of the nicotine market. Uh, by the way, when, when talking about Juul and Vipe and Logic, the, these companies are all owned or controlled by tobacco companies. Uh, Juul is 30%, thir one third owned by Philip Morris, which is the world's largest tobacco company. Vipe is 100% owned by Imperial Tobacco, which is Canada's largest tobacco company and Britain's largest, second largest in the world. And uh, Logic is owned by uh, uh, JTI and McDonald, which uh, is a huge tobacco company. So the tobacco companies are repositioning themselves as nicotine companies. And uh, what, the, what they're finding or what they're reporting to their shareholders is they're not losing any tobacco sales at all from vaping, they're just picking up more customers who are, who are addicted to nicotine and could potentially become tobacco users. So this is a, a, a period of market expansion and vertical integration for the tobacco companies and all those dirty tricks they've used over the years to peddle cigarettes and tobacco products to kids. They're now using the same dirty tricks to peddle nicotine products to kids. So we, we've got extra reason to uh, protect kids uh, from the clutches of uh, tobacco companies all over again. Now, uh, health risks of vaping, of nicotine addiction, nicotine poisoning, you know, uh, especially if we're de talking about the liquids. Um, and these liquids are often flavored. They come like cherry and bubble gum, whatever. And, and they, they very, these li and little vials that are very attractive. And, uh, you know, kids can break into these small children and, and drink it and become poisoned. But they, the levels of nicotine themselves in some of these pods, uh, if you smoke enough uh, or vape enough in a row, I mean, that can lead to a, a, de a degree of poisoning as well. Uh, nicotine is not uh, harmless, it is a poison. Uh, and uh, one drop of nicotine on your tongue will kill you. It, 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 it exists in very trace amounts in tobacco and nicotine. Uh, or tobacco and uh, and vaping products, but those trace amounts are still harmful and still addictive, um, and it alters brain development. I mean, all, nicotine addiction. When we're talking about addiction and dependency, uh, that is altering brain function. 
Uh, but when it involves teens who have developing brains, then that can become a, a bigger problem and uh, can put uh, dependency pathways in place. Like they, basically kids become hardwired uh, for nicotine uh, uh, be, because of their developing brain. Um, and uh, we've, there's a risk factors for respiratory disease, in, including popcorn lung, but also COPD and uh, bronchitis, et cetera. Uh, there's a, a new study that came out at the end of 2019 showing that uh, vaping increases the risk of certain lung diseases by uh, 40%. And uh, the bottom line though, is there's no need to wait for more studies here. I mean, we've all heard that. Well, it's, you know, the reluctant health minister or whoever doesn't want to regulate uh, nicotine right away, well, may, or vaping, maybe we need a few more studies. No, that's dead wrong. We don't need more studies. We know how harmful nicotine is. We, we, we know that uh, kids are getting addicted en masse. Uh, we know that it leads to tobacco dependency. That's enough. That's plenty to act on. Now, here's a risk of vaping. Uh, this, uh, this young gentleman, uh, uh, I think he was uh, 13 or 14 at the time, uh, in Lethbridge, uh, a uh, e-cigarette uh, device exploded in his face, a vaping device exploded in his face, and he suffered second-degree burns. Uh, fortunately, he had glasses on at the time, or he may very well have been blinded. So, you know, that's another risk of uh, vaping, is some of these products really aren't that safe, and they come from all kinds of peculiar places all over the world. And um, they, a lot of them have escaped regulation. Uh, now, uh, about two years ago, the federal government passed a vaping bill and basically added vaping to the Tobacco Act. What, it, what that bill failed to do, though, was to align restrictions on tobacco products with those on vaping. And instead, the government wanted to provide a balance between, between allowing adults to use vaping products to help them quit smoking or as a harm, less harmful alternative uh, versus uh, protecting kids from nicotine addiction. So they tried to achieve a balance, um, but honestly, they failed to achieve a balance. And uh, that... Uh, experience basically the, that this bill basically rolled out the red carpet for jewel and uh, opened the barn door for jewel and other uh, youth oriented nicotine products uh, and um, because these products weren't allowed in Canada before this act was passed when when the act was passed they were allowed with restrictions but unfortunately the restrictions were not in, enough to prevent these companies from contributing to the explosive rise in youth vaping, which followed. And here, in fact, are a whole bunch of exemptions uh, that apply to vaping products in the Tobacco and Vaping Products Act. Uh, well, it does ban advertising that does not depict people, um, but uh, there's all kinds of ways to advertise uh, lifestyles and activities that don't involve people. And I'm going to show you some of those examples. So uh, I think the intent was to uh, align the, the restrictions on vaping with the lifestyle advertising restrictions on tobacco, but the act failed to do that as well. The act did not deal with retail promotions and displays. Uh, and uh, in fairness, with tobacco, that was originally left up to the provinces as well. Um, the act did not put any restrictions on public consumption. No restrictions on nicotine content or online sales. And then there were very limited restrictions on flavors. And here, here's what we saw after the act was passed. Now, this was an act that was intended to control the promotion and sale uh, and marketing of vaping products in Canada. These ads didn't exist before. These ads were illegal 
before this act was passed because there was no enabling legislation to allow the ads to exist. But the federal legislation enabled these ads. Now, you can see these ads actually did depict people. So they were a, a direct flagrant violation. So these ads have been changed up and uh, the companies got their wrists slapped. I don't think there were any fines issued that I'm aware of, uh, but they did get their wrists slapped and were told to get the people out of these ads. So they did, and then they came out with some more ads that didn't have people, but were just as, almost as interesting as the ones that did. And uh, here's some of the social media ads. And as, as we know, kids live on social media, and this is where the vaping companies have really applied their promotional efforts. And uh, sadly, they've been very, very successful. Uh, retail. Uh, we've all seen the uh, tremendous amount of retail promotions, uh, pervasive, really, uh, to this day. Um, it, the tobacco or the uh, vaping companies have pulled some of this because they know what's coming, um, but uh, a lot of this still exists in retail environments, and kids spend a lot of time in retail environments. And uh, of course, we still have the retail displays, which are adjacent to the, they're at children's eye level, right on the counter. They are located adjacent to all the candy. You know, we, we banned the display of tobacco products for this very reason. And now we're dealing with this issue all over again with respect to vaping products. So that, that has to go. Um, so the federal government has admitted that it didn't get that balance right when it first passed the Tobacco and Vaping Products Act. Uh, so uh, they are now uh, bringing forward or proposing to bring forward more regulations to control point of sale advertising, public places advertising, uh, to put health messages on the uh, packaging and to control retail displays. So this is all coming, but it's it's moving pretty slowly through the regulatory process. And of course, you know, COVID is slowing everything down. So, you know, I, I don't know if we're gonna see any of this stuff before the end of 2020, quite honestly. Um, and then uh, they've also proposed uh, more recently uh, that they're going to bring forward uh, regulations to restrict nicotine concentrations further, flavorings and online sales. The current nicotine level for Canada is 60 milligrams um, per milliliter. They're planning to bring that down, which is basically the threshold for nicotine poisoning, as I understand it. And they're planning to bring that threshold down to 20 milligrams, which is more like a threshold for addiction um, versus poisoning. And then we've got a patchwork of provincial legislation across Canada. And some provinces have, uh, have backfilled in the absence of federal regulation when it comes to things like retail displays and promotions, outdoor advertising, uh, even nicotine levels uh, and, and flavorings. In fact, Nova Scotia and PEI have both banned flavorings. Uh, they've both set uh, a nicotine concentration level and uh, PEI has also prohibited, is prohibiting the sale of nicotine and, uh, and tobacco products to anyone under the age of 21. And in fact, the US passed the national age 21 law um, late last year. So uh, we might see those restrictions rolling out across provinces as well. Alberta is dead last in, in the race to the bottom uh, to regulate uh, nicotine products. Uh, however, uh, in the throne speech, uh, uh, in February, the provincial government announced that it is planning to bring forward vaping legislation in the, this session. Uh, of course, this session is being delayed, um, uh, possibly even to uh, later this summer, but uh, hopefully um, at, at some point we will see legislation tabled in the legislature and hopefully it'll be effective legislation that represents uh, the best uh, measures that have been approved uh, in all of the provinces. So we've talked about uh, the federal government and the provinces and the roles they can play, but that there's a number of things the municipalities can do as well, including 
prohibiting smoking and vaping in all public places frequented by youth. And in fact, we've got about uh, 10 or 12 municipalities in Alberta who've done just that, uh, who've basically prohibited the smoking and vaping of anything in all public places frequented by youth. So this is parks, playgrounds, sports fields, public events, uh, you know, major public places, uh, outdoor amenities where we can expect youth to congregate. So that would be a, a great first step. And uh, municipalities can also license and regulate vaping retailers and tobacco retailers, and can even uh, use that as a source of revenue to uh, better enforce these laws at, at the local level. Uh, they can add, create licensing conditions and categories. Uh, those conditions could include restrictions on certain products or restrictions on flavorings like Lloyd Minster has done. So uh, with tobacco products. So, you know, there are a number of options available. And then municipalities uh, often have their own police forces and or the RCMP and, and the local RCMP will often take direction from the municipality on what their enforcement priorities should be. There's always ongoing dialogue and discussion between police the, and uh, the local governments. So local governments and municipal councils can urge their police or the RCMP to more actively engage in the enforcement of these laws. And even local bylaw officers, many of them are have a peace officer designation. And in Alberta, any peace officer can enforce our Provincial Tobacco Act. And uh, hopefully by the end of this year, that Provincial Tobacco Act will also extend to vaping and vaping products. Uh, school boards, where, you know, this is a school health community that, um, uh, that uh, I'm speaking to here today. So here are some effective measures for school boards, starting with prohibiting the smoking and vaping of, uh, of anything on all school property at all times. Now, the Provincial Act prohibits tobacco use on all school property, but it doesn't address vaping. Uh, now, I would say about half of the school boards, at least half, have already dealt with vaping, but a number still haven't. So, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for uh, school boards to take some leadership and make sure that they are aligning all restrictions on smoking and vaping on all products. And then we don't have to keep revisiting this every time there's a new product on the market. Uh, if it, it applies to the use and smoking and vaping of all products, right? Uh, we're also urging school boards to encourage their schools to provide effective prevention education in grades K to nine, smoking and vaping prevention. Uh, and particularly grades four to nine are the critical uh, grades. And there are, uh, Alberta Health Services has a great program out there called um, the Academy Prevention Program. It's all evidence-based, it was very well developed. And that's for uh, kids in grades four to six. And uh, they're also in the process of rolling out a new program uh, for grades seven to nine that also addresses vaping. So um, you can go to the Alberta Health Services website and, and look for those programs. Uh, or you can just visit our website. We've got a link. Uh, ash.ca, by the way. And uh, school boards can also offer smoking cessation programs and treatment to all smokers and vapors, regardless of age. Uh, and uh, uh, making sure that all staff and, and students uh, have access to these programs and to treatment. Uh, here are some other things. Uh, ASH has a model school board policy that's up on our website. And uh, that policy is based upon best practices, evidence-based best practices includes a number of measures that we've already discussed, uh, like making sure you've got a consistent policy that applies to smoking and vaping of anything, making sure that you've got effective prevention programs in place, effective cessation programs, making sure that it applies to all visitors and staff at all times, ensuring that there are proper enforcement uh, measures in place. Now, when it, when it comes to enforcement though, especially with kids, you know, we really stress a, an approach that doesn't just rely on punitive measures, or if you are using punitive measures, that they are remedial measures. Uh, because a lot, of, a lot of schools and school boards have been suspending kids who are caught with vaping products. And look, I know there's often complicating issues uh, contributing 
to a suspension. It's often not just vaping. But in, in cases when it is just vaping, keep in mind that uh, nicotine is addictive. Nicotine addiction is an illness, just like asthma or diabetes is an illness. And uh, we, it, you have, we have to have some compassion here and, and realize that, uh, that when, when addiction is involved, kids and people aren't necessarily exercising free will or free choice. And they may, in their mind, need to have that vaping device on them to get through a class or to get through the day. Um, so I'm not saying we shouldn't be uh, putting some enforcement uh, measures in place, but uh, they should be compassionate and they should be remedial um, and sh should rely on harsh, uh, try not to rely on harsh penalties like suspensions uh, to the greatest extent possible. You know, we don't want this youth vaping problem to result in a dropout problem, right? Um, that would be the worst case scenario. It's bad enough as is. And um, the school boards can also ensure that they are adhering to all the local and provincial laws. And, you know, by visiting the ASH website, you, you can keep on top of, of what's happening because we will have a new provincial law here, hopefully by the end of the year. And school boards, particularly trustees themselves, because they are politicians, uh, can um, definitely liaise uh, with their federal and provincial uh, elected counterparts and encourage them to take further action. Um, and I know there's lots of uh, collaboration and lots of discussion uh, between various levels of government and uh, elected officials and use those opportunities when you meet with your MLAs and MPs to advance the case for better provincial and federal laws because both are lacking right now. Well, the provincial law is absent <laughs> and the federal law is severely lacking. Uh, now, run, almost running out of time, I wanna keep, uh, there's gonna be some time for questions here. Uh, here's our school board resource hub. And now this is all being revamped because we're actually developing hubs for all four Western provinces right now. Um, but you can go to ash.ca slash school board and uh, get access to our model smoking policy and uh, charts showing what other Alberta school boards are doing. Um, access to uh, the latest data on youth smoking and vaping um, and uh, school prevention resources, et cetera. So just go to ash.ca slash school board and uh, we've got a number of uh, school and school board resources available for you. Uh, now we've got some, uh, speaking of Health Canada, the federal government, um, the Health Canada was good enough to give us a three-year grant to help prevent the renormalization of smoking in the four Western provinces that could result from cannabis legalization and also uh, the explosive rise in youth vaping. So the federal government does recognize that uh, there, we do have a problem that needs to be addressed. And uh, we, they have provided us with funding. We, we certainly appreciate that um, to do our part to prevent the renormalization of smoking. When we first developed the project, the main objective was, uh, our main concern was cannabis legalization, but that has since switched to the explosive rise in youth vaping. But the policy solutions are the same. So that makes it easy. And uh, we are collaborating with uh, the, we, we have tobacco reduction coalitions in every province in Canada. And uh, we are collaborating with the coalitions in BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, Manitoba uh, on this particular project. And we currently have policy specialists in all four Western capitals. And we are supporting the development of local bylaws, school board policies, post-secondary policies, and provincial legislation to, to address vaping and smoking in public places. Awesome, sorry, I was struggling and, to unmute uh, my mic. Got, uh, policy <laughs> so thank you so much, Les, for the wonderful Robinson presentation. I will now open well, the floor to questions. The policy um, please Alberta type your questions well. in the chat tab. Also, just a reminder to stick around and complete the so, quick survey at the uh, end. Thank you, everyone. The webinar recording uh, will be available your time on our website and your later interest. this week. And if you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead. Uh, Jasmine, I'll turn it over to you.
Yes. Okay, so Les, the first question is, if there are 50,000 youth vaping, as they will be- Well, somebody provided the link how and which for treatment center uh, is available uh, in Alberta the Academy for program, Alberta Health Services, which is academy.albertaquits.ca. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we do have a number of resources in Alberta to help people quit smoking. We have the uh, provincial quit line. And uh, I understand that uh, people who are trying to quit vaping can also use that, access that line. Um, we have the Alberta Quits website. And again, there are resources to help people quit vaping. Um, you know, people always have access uh, through private plans uh, and and provincial plans to um, addiction counselors. Um, second question and, is, uh, to, is there any uh, way to get some feedback on a proposed and, and municipal health policy? Workers. Uh, so some people don't realize, like even through your benefits plan, your EAP programs and such, you have uh, access to individual counseling and that extends to addiction uh, in many cases. Uh, so sometimes people just aren't aware of all the supports that are available. Yeah, just send it my way, Cole, and I'll be happy to give you some feedback on it. But um, we have our, uh, all, all our policy charts are up on our website. So if you go to ash.ca forward slash municipal, you will see all the municipal bylaws in Alberta. And, uh, in, in, and they're up on a chart, so you can quickly compare which ones have uh, gold standard policies versus which ones don't. And one of the fundamental hallmarks is uh, making sure that these bylaws address the smoking and vaping of anything and okay, so add as many if you public have any additional questions possible, please feel free to contact including Les. parks um, playgrounds, his email is hagen h-a-g-e-n um, at ash.ca uh, or give him a call at 780 426 so welcome. oh there's somebody typing here oh there was another question Les. so why doesn't the government allow vaping products through the position Description and, and restrictions loosened up. Uh, these other products are strictly prohibited by the terms of the Canadian Clean Air Act. So I want to make sure that I get this sure. prophylaxis, which is quite onerous. Well, by prescription, um, at one point in time, uh, nicotine replacement products like the gum, uh, I, I believe, were available through prescription, and, and the restrictions loosened up. Um, but the gum and these other products are strictly regulated by Health Canada. They had to be approved through the uh, federal dr drug uh, approval process, which is quite onerous and uh, makes puts restrictions on uh, marketing to kids, etc. Unfortunately, e-cigarettes came onto the market before Health Canada could regulate them. So the horse was already out of the barn, and uh, now they're trying to get this back to the scenario where we have prescript, uh, physicians prescribing is probably not realistic. I would say something that is more realistic is taking every possible measure from a regulatory perspective to keep these products out of the hands of kids. The easiest thing to do is simply to align all of the restrictions we have on tobacco products with those on vaping products because our federal and provincial laws on tobacco products have been working. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we have the lowest smoking rates among adults and youth ever, because we have effective policy measures in place.
And those measures include large graphic health warnings, smoking bans in public places and workplaces, um, very significant restrictions on marketing and promotions, uh, ban on retail displays, you know, it goes on and on. Canada has some of the strongest tobacco control laws in the world. We now have plain packaging on all cigarettes that came into effect last fall. Uh, so uh, if we simply applied all right. of these effective so tobacco the policies to vaping chat. products, um, if you could stick we around to would be one step ahead of quick survey again. just to let us know how the webinar It's a went very simple solution. We like just to need covered. to align so thank you again. the restrictions on vaping products and with the very during, effective during restrictions we have If we can provide support in any products. way, please don't hesitate to reach out. It's dirt simple. So I will be opening the polls now. Considering your expectations prior to the webinar was the content, what you expected. So please select one of the following options. It is 100% anonymous. Um, oh, maybe, I don't know why you can't see it. I will share the results with you following the completion of the poll, though, Alice. I don't know why you can't see it. All right, so I'm going to close the first poll here and we'll open the next one. All right, and now the next poll will be open shortly. 